In 2009, a brave young woman and brave young man entered an office of the organization known as ACORN. Here is the award-winning story that unfolded. talk to you about which it might complicate our taxes is that we got a couple girls overseas coming over you know what I mean mm -hmm. there's about there's 13 girls from El Salvador that I've kind of gotten wind on the street that are going to be coming to town and I've let the right people know that I'm interested in taking care of them and getting them used to the area and they're very young and we don't want to we don't want to put them on the on the books they're kind of dependent they're from El Salvador they, okay there's like 13 of them Okay. And they're probably going to move in with, into the house just that we get. for a year or two to get them on their feet. Just to get them on their feet so they can do this type of thing. So you want to put, okay, why do y'all even want to do taxes? Oh, because of the house. Because we need, a, we need a house, and everyone else has been discriminatory. But the point is that there's going to be 13 El Salvadorian girls coming into this house. Mm -hmm. We don't want to, we don't want that to cause any trouble. I mean, as far as, as, far as anything, taxes? as far as the feds coming in, saying you got I mean, see, as, far as, the, as far as the feds coming in, um, as far as the house is concerned, but the tax part, man, mm -hmm. if you want to cover yourself on that part, you can issue them 1099s. But they're not even legal citizens. Um, uh, well, I mean, couldn't they, like, if I am a performing artist Okay, and I if they don't have social security numbers, right. yeah. then you don't have to worry because they can't file taxes anymore. Anyway. So they but can just be like... What are you supposed to do about them? We don't have to worry about them? You don't have to worry about them. You don't, and, and not unless but they're going to like, they go get an ID, not federal... Sorry, they're if they're going to get a social security number... Mm -hmm. Even for working. Well, they're like 15. Oh, well, then you don't worry about them. Okay. But then you know what? You can always claim them as dependents. Can you all of them? Mm -hmm. But well, could if we they claim are, if some they of them as dependents and yeah. still have the other ones there? Sure. Well, they're like 15. Oh, uh, well, then you don't worry about them. Okay. But then you know what? You can always claim them as dependents. If they're living in your, okay, if you want to do this, you want to start this business, the name of the proprietor would be you. The principal business would be uh, performing parts, okay? No. Um, then the address for right now would be what? The boat. The boat. Okay. The boat's on the chest. All right. Then the amount of money you make. Right now, you don't have employees, but when the girls come, they're really not going to be employees because you're, you're not going to issue them W-2s at the end of the year. I don't even they're know. under 16, yeah. so you don't worry about that. But on the, the other part of the, of the return, you can use them as a dependent. So, okay. You can use them as a dependent because they live in your house, especially if they're under 16. Okay. You can say they well, they live in the boat, which whatever. Yeah. And you're taking care of them. Yeah. So you can use them as a dependent. What if they're making money because they're performing they're tricks too? Like, if they're making money and they're underage, you shouldn't be letting nobody know anyway. <laughs> Oh. What? True, you shouldn't be letting anyone know anyway. Well, that's when what I that's was, what happens. We tell the bankers and they when, kick us out. Right, was, because they because was, it's yeah. illegal. They're really not gonna be employees because you you're not going to issue them W-2s at the end of the year. I don't even They're know. under 16, Yeah. so you don't worry about that. But on the, the other part of the, of the return, you can use them as a dependent. So, okay. You can use them as a dependent. If they don't know, you know what I'm saying, what you're bringing in or whatever going on, if nobody's telling it, then they won't know to come I look mean, for it's, it. It's Anna Giles has understandably received national and international coverage and awards for her brave investigative journalism work. She and her husband, Joseph Bissell, launched the American Phoenix Foundation, a nonprofit organization based in Austin, Texas, with the mission to protect the American Republic through ethical, innovative, and technologically driven journalism. Please note that this afternoon, at following our, the conclusion of our conference, Hannah will be hosting a free seminar for aspiring investigative journalists or those who simply want to learn more about this important work. That will be in another room here in the Grand. It's the, I believe, the Saddle Creek, or Saddle, it's Saddle something, sorry, I don't have the name right, uh, here in the hotel, but that, that is a free uh, seminar at 2.30 this afternoon.
Let's give a rousing steamboat welcome for one courageous young woman, Hannah Giles. ZZ Top song. <laughs> um, when I was 12 years old, my dad took me backstage to go meet ZZ Top. I didn't know who that was. I was 12. I liked the music. Um, we're backstage. It was really exciting. And then my sister and I saw these homeless guys eating the food backstage. I'm like, why are there homeless men backstage? This isn't special if homeless men are allowed back here. Well, it was ZZ Top. And <laughs> <laughs> And they're pretty nice guys, but anyway, can y'all believe what you just saw on the videos? That happened all over the country multiple times. And um, I was 20 years old when I undertook that mission. Um, before that, so before I did those undercover videos, I was a surfer and a Brazilian jiu-jitsu practitioner. I'm still both, I still practice those things. Um, I had no interest in ever being on TV. I just wanted to surf. I wanted to fight 300-pound men, and I wanted to go surf in the Pacific Islands. Um, so when this story hit headlines, my days on the mats and in the water became severely numbered. This signaled a major lifestyle change, and I'm not sure if I was ready for it at the time. Suddenly, I was making appearances on national news. I gave Fox News Channel some of the best ratings they've ever had. I personally got sued a few times, and back at home, my church and family were protected by our local police department because of the outrageous number of threats we received. I've learned a lot since then, and I'm ready to take my work to the next level. Two major changes happened in my life since those videos were released. I got married to a Christian man who understands my calling, and I founded the American Phoenix Foundation to facilitate more stories like my ACORN investigation and to equip hundreds like me to do the same. One thing about my husband, Joe, and you guys can look at this because he's in the back, but in his red wedding ring, it's a big silver one, I had a saying inscribed in Latin, and it translates to justice even though the heavens fall. And this means that even though everything around us is failing, we must stand for justice. If we do so, our society and our families will be better for it. We as advocates for liberty are playing a game of chess. Our problem is we are playing with half the pieces. We are losing the narrative war every single day. When we lose the narrative war, we lose our culture and we lose the political realm. This results in unchecked corruption and rampant moral failure. The media used to expose these things, exposing corruption, challenging authority. But now the establishment media has become part of that corrupt power structure. Journalism schools in America destroy the courage and creativity of justice-seeking young people and replace it with a desire to join the power structure rather than speaking truth to power. We must be in the minds, or be in the business of reaching hearts and minds. This is very different than our modern 50-50 politics. As you all know, most issues are not 50-50. And it's the media creating an impression that there is a split right down the middle of the country and that we have to fight for that middle 1%. These efforts do not and have not moved the ball forward. We must go over the heads of the media, jump over that imaginary 50-50 line, and show America the truth. We have to disrupt false narratives. So let's look at my ACORN investigation. 
Why did it work? Everyone talks about it, and it was like a scandal, but no one, I don't think anyone really understands why, why it worked. So for too long, Acorn got away with the story that they were helping poor people. Never mind Acorn's leaders, since the beginning of the organization, Acorn's leaders were directly robbing the people that they claimed to help. Never mind they had been investigated so many times for frauds, especially voter fraud and their involvement in the mortgage crisis. But the moment my videos came out, showing Acorn all too willing and able to help facilitate underage prostitution, the US legislative bodies voted overwhelmingly to defund them, the Census Bureau severed ties with them, and their private investors, that's very important, their private investors distanced themselves from the group. The evidence was clear and undeniable, shedding light on over 30 years of corrupt practices. Was it efficient? We all know that some movement practices aren't necessarily efficient. So let's take a look at my project. Obama sent, spent over $700 million winning the 2008 election, and McCain spent over $300 million losing the 2008 election. Between James and I, we spent less than $1,500 making our ACORN videos. Considering Obama's ties with the group, I think it is arguable that if we had done those videos in the fall of 2008, rather than the fall of 2009, we would have had an entirely different president. It didn't happen, you don't need to clap. <laughs> So it's for reasons like these that we need and must have courageous, sharp, principled, and uncompromising young journalists sprinkled across this nation. Please imagine with me what kind of culture and what kind of political climate that would exist if we broke stories that destroyed false narratives on a weekly or even monthly basis. It will be on the backs of hardworking and disciplined young men and women that this capacity will be developed. We need the help, encouragement, and support so that this never becomes just a job or a chore or a way of us grasping for power. Frankly, a free society needs real journalism to hold the powerful accountable. Um, there's a st My husband and I met undercover in Boston, and um, we, we didn't really like each other at first. But we were stuck together, and we ended up at the airport in Boston, going to go on separate flights. And we were sitting together, staring at the sunset. And he said, do you ever think we'll be as corrupt as the people that we're investigating? And I said, yes, absolutely, if we don't train up other people to hold us accountable. So that being said, I do not want to control the media establishment. I think that given that power, even us here in this room would fall prey to our human nature. This would in turn do no good for the American people and perpetuate their apathy towards our media. Our highest use right now is strategically placed reporters and initiatives to hold our leaders and our media accountable. Accountability is what we seek, courage is what we need, and content is what we must deliver. I don't think Colorado needs 30 more websites. It would be amazing if all of you guys could work together, hunker down to expose false narratives. Let's get a show of hands. How many of you, with the biggest story of your life, how many of you, given your acorn, would give it away, would remove your byline, if it meant reaching more people and doing more good? There's a little honesty in here. I couldn't do that. I wasn't at a place of maturity or experience to make a decision like that. But you need to think about this when you're discovering why you're here in the first place. We can't go into the field of journalism with the mindset to change the world. That's why the progressive movement got involved in the first place. We must go into journalism and stay there for the relentless pursuit of truth and justice, no matter the what the outcome may be. 
This must be the foundation and basis for our work. Our passion, our goal, must be truth and justice, not the desire to take down our foes, not the desire to help out those we perceive to be our friends. Journalism is not advocacy. Journalism is not stenography. If it was either of these things, it would serve no purpose. Hold your own feet to the fire, require evidence over opinion, demand industriousness over celebrity. My team is devoted to learning, working, and teaching as if America's future was on the line. I'm asking all of you to use your time and all of your talents to disrupt the narratives that are ruining this country, and I'm asking you to join me as I start my life's work of narrative disruption in the pursuit of justice. Okay, so I wanna open this up to questions and discussion, and I have a lot of other notes to get you guys going if you can't do it yourselves, so. <laughs> Hannah, I don't really have a question for you, but I do have a quote from former U.S. Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis. Sunshine is the best disinfectant. Amen. <laughs> Hannah, um, I, I was impressed by the fact that you did that video when you were 20 years old. Um, that's awfully young to be getting so deeply involved in such a a conspiracy of corruption that's so rampant throughout our country. Um, I'm just curious, uh, and, and by the way, you present yourself as, um, as someone who's well beyond her years, um, so I'm very impressed by that. Uh, but how did you stumble upon this concept, this idea? How did you hear about ACORN, and how did you devise and come up with the, the, the plan to do what you did? I'm interested to hear the backstory of how you got this thing um, to the media. No one ever believes me when I tell that story, but I'm telling the truth. Um, when I was a sophomore in college, I started writing for my school newspaper. That was during the 08 elections. So I was, you know, all the stuff with Obama and his ties with ACORN and voter fraud were coming out. I was discovering his relationship with Saul Alinsky, all that stuff, and I would write about it in my school newspaper. Well, then Obama got elected in 2008, and I was like, this, I've spent all this time writing and researching and nothing came of it. You know, it didn't make an impact. And for a while I just gave up, but I, I knew that there was some way to make an impact in journalism and it probably wasn't writing articles. Fast forward to the summer of 2009, my mom was driving me up to DC and she said, hey, maybe you'll get to investigate your ACORN finally because they have offices up there. I was like, mom, I'm an intern I, won't, I will never have a chance, no one will listen to me, um, I probably won't even have time to do it. Well, I lived in southeast DC, right next to the Marine Corps barracks, and I was really stressed out. I didn't like DC, and I went on a jog. The Marine Corps barracks are over there, I was like, maybe I can go look at some cute guys and get some stress out. Um, as I was jogging past the barracks, I passed Acorn Housing, and it was their national headquarters, literally three blocks from my house. And I looked inside and I was, it hit me and I was like, oh my gosh, I could do an investigation. I mean, this is, they're right here. They're in my backyard. And as I was jogging, I passed some prostitutes and drug dealers and I was just devastated because it was real. That narrative that Acorn is supposed to be helping the community. Um, and yet there was just dep depravity all over. And by the time I, was, I jogged back to my apartment, the idea was formulated. I remember sliding into my apartment and telling my friend, I was like, what do you think about this idea? And uh, she said, it's crazy, but it'll work. And that's, that's how I did it. So. <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, the strategy that you're coming up with here, it just seems so powerful, and uh, I'm quite impressed with your idea. And um, it seems like what we're up against, and I was talking with somebody yesterday, 
talking about the other side uses kind of the idea that the end justifies the means and they'll use whatever means that they need, including lying or whatever. And it's, it's kind of scary, but uh, I think you understand um, that. And I think it's good for all of us um, to be aware of it too. And that, I mean, we heard also yesterday about we need to have the wisdom to know what is right and the courage to do what is right. Mm -hmm. And it's a whole different way of thinking. And so I just thank you. I look forward to seeing what you're up to in the future. Um, you know, even if you don't believe in ends justify the means, you have to understand that. You have to know the way the media is working right now. And, and it's, it's devastating. And I've become extremely cynical, and I'm only 23 years old. But you have to, under, you have to really understand how they operate. And my husband and I, we've, we've helped other people that are about to go through a media cycle or they've come out with a big story. And, and when we're coaching them, we say, you know, it's no holds barred. You know, this is what they're going to do. And they're like, oh, no, because, you know, because their, their story is true. They're like, it's the truth. It'll be OK. It'll, it'll prevail. But you have a force. You have a system. You have the media establishment and all of her friends working very hard to hide those truths and to keep them in the dark corners. And so if you can just understand that they're going to do that and understand some of the strategy behind that, you can outwit them. And that's what, you know, when we um, gave our videos to Andrew Breitbart to release them, he, he said, um, he's like, you have, to, you have to trust me. I was like, I don't know you. I'm not going to trust you. And he's like, He's like, I believe in this stuff. I believe in these videos, and just trust me. So what he did was release the videos one at a time, and because we knew the media was going to lie. So we released one video, and they said, oh, it's an isolated incident. This is just one acorn office. It didn't happen anywhere else, whatever. Those ladies got fired. Well, then we released another video. And they said, oh, well, they were just on the East Coast and da 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 and they tried and then this is they tried to go to XYZ and they listed all the cities we had actually gone to and they said but they got kicked out. So then in the order of the cities that they listed, we released the videos, just crossing it out. And it showed that they were liars, blatantly lying. Um, the, a bunch of the mainstream media outlets wouldn't touch our story with a 10-foot pole until John Stewart, a comedian, took on our story. And he said, I'm a fake journalist, and I'm embarrassed that these kids scoop me. He said, media, mainstream media, where are you on this one? And then South Park made a whole episode on what we did. <laughs> and so just understanding, like, they're going to lie. They're going to be mean. But then also, how's the best way to get a message across? Comedy. And that once John Stewart and South Park made a story, then the rest of the media followed suit. And it finally, I think it was like seven days before the mainstream media, besides Fox, started reporting on our stuff. Hannah, <coughs> Hannah, excuse me, congratulations as well on what you've done. Uh, far more than most of us old timers have ever been able to do in the years we've been given and the opportunities in front of us. Uh, you worked with James O'Keefe, correct? Yes, um, I did. Yeah, um, and, uh, and kudos to, to both of you then. You, you've done something far better than, than what historically we, in politics, we always put under the umbrella of opposition research. And the left, le the left took that to an art form, not just finding out, gee, what, did he pay his taxes, did he not, what jobs did he have, where did he go to school, uh, see if there's anything under the, under the carpet behind the, the curtain. Uh, but you've, you've really exposed the truth here. The left has used their opposition research typically to try to uh, destroy individuals. You've just exposed the truth. I remember when, uh, when uh, I think it was, came out of New Mexico, the, the first uh, investigation into the phony jobs creation claims from the stimulus funding from the Obama administration. And when they looked there, they quickly looked in other states and we found out that, uh, I guess, documented what many of us already thought, that they were wasting hundreds of billions of dollars. I believe, my question now uh, to you, I believe that uh, another project that James has taken on, maybe you're involved in it as well, is this whole uh, voter fraud 
um, um, rampant virus that spread all across the country. I know Alan's very involved in the issue in South Carolina. But he, I think uh, James is calling it Project Veritas. Yes, that's his. Yeah. And, and can you speak to that a little bit and what he's uncovered and found and maybe a little bit more about your American Phoenix Foundation and what you hope to get done there and how maybe the rest of us can help? Um, you know, I don't, I, I've watched the videos just like everyone else, so I don't know the ins and outs and details besides what is out in the mainstream. Um, I, it's, I mean, I, I guess a lot of people didn't know, but the voter, there's no voter ID laws in a lot of states. Like, those are really old laws. Um, and I think what he's doing is just showing, hey, you know, those laws were written 100 years ago or something, and maybe it's time to update it considering the times. And, but that's really all I know besides I've watched the videos just like you did. Um, at Phoenix Foundation, we, we focus on long-term projects. And we do extensive amounts of research and studying and, I guess, opposition research before we send people in um, to go uncover stories. And all I can say is that be watching in the next six months. So. <laughs> <laughs> and I think with the with voter the voter fraud issue, um, it's a, it's systematic, all over the country. It's happening, but it's it's not at. And I'm Catherine Engelbright from True the Vote is a friend of ours. Um, it's not it's not like oh 50 percent of all the votes are fraud, but it is you know just a couple of points can throw a whole election, and and I think since Acorn was so tainted. Um, Maybe these groups haven't stopped being corrupt and you know, participating in the things they were in the past, but they're at least crossing their T's and dotting their I's now. So maybe that's a little improvement, I don't know. Hi, Hannah. Um, I guess I'd like to elaborate on that a little bit. We've all heard that ACORN has kind of gone underground and mm -hmm. is supposedly resurfacing under different group names. I wondered if you knew of any names of those groups, and if you would plan, if you're planning on uh, maybe doing some exposure of, of the new groups, if there are any. Um, I know that there are people, friends of mine, working on the new groups. And the way I put it with Acorn, if Walmart went out of business, what would all the general managers do? What would all the workers do? They're, that's their job. They would either go create new organizations or they would get jobs at other groups that did the same thing. Um, that's basically what happened. And I'm trying to see how to put this. Um, Matthew Vadum, he has, he has a great book. It's called Subversion, Inc. And he's one of the foremost researchers on ACORN. Um, he has like detailed not only ACORN's history, but the plans of all those groups going forward. And he actually made a great point towards the end of the book. He said, yes, the ACORN videos were the catalyst for what happened to ACORN, but they weren't the reason. Um, not only had they been corrupt for 30 years and all that evidence came to light, but Bertha Lewis, what, who's president of ACORN, she was president of ACORN, big umbrella group. ACORN itself had hundreds of other little sub-organizations. She was we only went to Acorn Housing, which was like a little subsection of Acorn Umbrella Group. So she went out on the media saying, they went after Acorn and they're racist and they're evil and all this stuff. And, and she started defending Acorn as if we had gone into Acorn Big Umbrella Group, where we had only gone into Acorn Housing. If she would have not defended Acorn at all and stayed back, Acorn itself would have still been an entity. But she made the mistake of not realizing that we only did Acorn Housing, a small little group, and so it was actually her fault. So <laughs> I take no responsibility. <laughs> Hannah, thank you so much Is it on? Um, for doing what you do. You've got a lot of guts, and we really appreciate it. My question is, uh, yesterday Tom McDevitt said that, or I think he said that he was encouraged about the journalists and the young people coming out. I'd like to know what you feel about the journalist schools that are in existence right now and the type of product there um, that are coming out of these schools. 
Yeah, um, as I already mentioned, jur journalism schools uh, teach and prepare students to be a part of the existing media system, and it's the existing media system that has unquestionably failed us. Um, I sincerely believe that students that go into the field of journalism, like bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, ready to save the world somehow, I, I believe they come in with that type of innocence and that kind of courage. Um, by the end of it, and I was in journalism school and programs, and a lot of my staff was on in journalism schools as well, it's literally, okay, play by the rules, just do what you're told, you know, you're going to, I don't know, you graduate with $50,000 or more of debt and sign up for a $32,000 a year job and just do what your boss tells you, right, right. Maybe one day you can move to Washington, maybe one day you can be a White House correspondent, and maybe one day you can write a book. But in the meantime, for 30 years, you just got to play the games and go to the social functions and don't, you know, don't ruffle anybody's feathers. And in some instance when kids are professionals are brave enough to ruffle the feathers, it's their bosses that say, nope, you can't do it. So this, it's this system, and I don't have to convince any of you that it's corrupt and it's not serving its purpose. But journalism is a skill, and so I think if, if kids are taught principles and you know, direction and, and why it's necessary, and then they actually go out and start doing beat reporting and crime reporting, all this stuff, police ride-alongs, if you can get that real world experience, then they'll know how to apply it. And there's no reason, and I'm proof, that you have to go through the system. I dropped out of school. I was in a journalism program. Andrew Breitbart said, drop out of school. They're going to brainwash you. You already have more experience than all of them. Come mentor, be, you know, I'll mentor you. One of my mentors was a former uh, journalism pre professor at Boston University, and he would all day tell me, forget everything you already know. Let's go practice, practice, practice. And you just have to do it. Courage and discipline. Um, one thing that uh, Congressman Bupre asked is, how can you guys help with Phoenix Foundation? Right now, actually, in Colorado, we are, this fall, planning on developing four to six college newspapers on different campuses. And that's a way for... <laughs> That's a way for us to get in there and get in touch with these kids. And even if they are going to go through school, we can at least be developing them and working on their principles and stuff for when they do go into the marketplace. But what else? Perhaps uh, this might be another lead for you for another story. When uh, Solyndra, uh, the president and vice president of the hierarchy of Solyndra, came on national TV and declared bankruptcy, they took the Fifth Amendment. A part of the Fifth Amendment probably was a CYA from their respect, but it might be an interesting story to see, you know, follow the money, follow the money. What happened to the 500 million and where did it go? One of the first people that ever did, that's a great, I mean, that would be a great project, but um, one of the first people that ever did follow the money was Ida Tarbell. And it's funny that and don't think I'm a feminist or anything right now, but I think it's funny that the first investigative journalists in America were women. Nellie Bly started off, and she actually went undercover into an insane asylum. And the only what she had to do it because women weren't getting a fair shake in journalism, so she went undercover and she exposed all that stuff. Ida Tarbell did follow the money. She was much more astute researching, and she investigated Standard Oil and broke open that whole story. Um, Follow the money isn't something that most journalists or, or even uh, conservative outlets, it's not something that is really encouraged because as you're following the money and researching, that takes time. And most businesses and uh, media outlets are businesses, you can't forget that, they need money, they need hits. Um, so I think it's understanding and for all of y'all when young people are coming up demanding that research before they go out and do a story is absolutely huge, and training that discipline is gonna be crucial. So definitely encourage young people, and don't complain if a story doesn't come out in two weeks. Hannah, uh, back in um, 
Vero Beach, I work with a guy who works with youth, and he claims that what motivates them is the truth. And I've heard you mention that over and over. Could you give us a little, you know, window into, you know, what motivates you about the truth, and does it motivate, you know, other people your age, and what should we be doing to create more Hannahs? First of all, the truth is super scandalous. It's like going to be the best scandal that you can ever get once you find it. <laughs> um, and, and just as, as young people, especially I went to public school, Miami-Dade County, Broward County, um, definitely brainwashed, public university. Um, we students, even if they're not so smart, they realize that it's like phony and they want to rebel against the system. And so once you give a young person an outlet that says, hey, you can do something about this, instead of just complaining or yelling at your teacher or going home depressed, you say, hey, here's a little something you could go do. They're going to do it. Because my younger generations, and all of you know this, they're like, oh, well, you're old. I'm not going to listen to you. And I mean, that's instinctive in us. And we question, and questions are alive and well. And so you give them an outlet like journalism, and you say, hey, here's a story. Go find the truth. Ask questions. Here's a science experiment. Go ask questions. We're going to we're gonna find the truth. And it's fun. And it's sensational. I'll just make one comment. Doesn't look like anybody else has a question now. Incredibly uh, insightful of you, or of your husband, I should say, okay, to, uh, to ask the question about will we become that corrupt? Mm -hmm. And your reply about the necessity of being accountable, uh, again, that shows wisdom far beyond your ages that most people don't have. Real quick to that, um, I was on Glenn Beck t uh, GBTV two weeks ago, and they're saying, "How do we, you know, how do we get conservatives elected? How do we do blah 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 blah?" If you're a politician, you need to be held accountable. And most people give up, even even if you're not a journalist. Most people give up. They're like, "Oh, my guy won. <laughs> he's going to do everything perfectly now. You know, he's a savior." No. It's our jobs to keep those people accountable. Also, not only keep ourselves accountable and have, you know, whatever, but you got to keep those people in power accountable too. And even if you're not, you know, a super secret undercover journalist, you have the ability to keep your uh, elected officials accountable. Uh, Hannah, I meant to say this when I spoke earlier. Um, this morning I did a presentation on voter ID, voter fraud. I mm -hmm. actually showed the video that James O'Keefe did. I've met James O'Keefe a couple times. Mm -hmm. um, but I showed the video of Eric Holder's ballot, him being offered Eric Holder's ballot, ballot and um, <clears throat> when Eric Holder says there's no voter fraud. Um, but um, you also mentioned someone else, and I didn't credit them when I did that presentation because some of the data that I got got from uh, that was true the vote. Catherine mm -hmm. Engelbrecht and I have gotten become friends, and I've actually done a uh, thing at the Heritage Foundation with her, mm -hmm. and um, appreciate you for calling her out because truethevote.com. I highly recommend all of you go to it and um, not only support Hannah's organization, but True the Vote is a, is a wonderful. They're the ones that uncovered the eight counties in Illinois where there was like 500 percent voters, more 500 you know, five times the number of people voting than there were people living in a county. Um, but they're, they're working on that. She and I are actually doing, we're, we're doing a thing together in Tampa on Tuesday, uh, unless Hurricane Obama comes through and I can't get down there. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, but um, I would encourage you all to go to the True the Vote because that's where I got a lot of my data. And, of course, Hannah, I could really use your group in South Carolina. I all really right. could use you all. So let's talk. <laughs> okay, let's talk. As long as it's not a two-party consent state, I'll be fine. <laughs> One more from Bob Oprah. Well, a, um, a, really a, a, a statement and a, a, a wish from this group. Uh, Hannah, I know, uh, and anybody who's been in the public arena knows that the uh, left doesn't, doesn't always play fair, and they sometimes play pretty rough. Uh, I can only imagine, I'm not asking you to tell us, but I can only imagine uh, what you have been subjected to uh, and, uh, and, and the risk that you and Joe and your family are taking. So. On behalf of me, and I hope all of these folks will join me in saying thank you for being willing to do that, not, uh, not just for yourself and finding the truth, but I know you're really doing it for all of us. So God bless you for that. Thank you.